This, this section is titled The Other Bucket List, 25 Documents That No One Should Be Without. And it will be presented by Carrie Peck. Carrie is the managing partner of the Chicago, Northbrook, and Oak Brook law firm of Peck Ritchie, where he concentrates his practice in trust and estate litigation, estate planning administration, guardianship, and elder law. Mr. Peck is past president of the 22,000 member um, Chicago Bar Association. Carrie is a certified advanced practitioner through the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys, which is peer nominated and who exemplify trustworthiness, professionalism, and skillfulness. Carrie co-wrote the books, Alzheimer's in the Law and Don't Let Dementia Steal Everything, written and published at the request of the American Bar Association. And he is a frequent speaker at continuing education seminars for attorneys and healthcare professionals across the country. Carrie, you can take it away. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> Welcome. Thank you for joining us today at this terrific event, ElderWorks Virtual uh, Senior Fair. I'm pleased to be with you today. And today we're going to talk about the, uh, other, the other bucket list, so to speak. And um, <clears throat> what we'd like to do is take questions during the course of the event, so it's very interactive. I like to do interactive presentations rather than just lecture at you. So please uh, use your chat feature and Lauren will let us know whether there's questions and we'll take them uh, as best as we can during the course of the presentation. So let's get rolling. Lauren, please open our slides. As I indicated, this is the other bucket list, 25 documents no one should be without. Next slide, please. So I think that, uh, you know, <clears throat> the elephant in the room is a pretty obvious one. Regrettably, uh, life is fragile. We all, uh, unfortunately, will pass. I think that uh, the fragility of life is now critically important that everybody uh, take prompt action in light of the pandemic. COVID-19 has, has changed everyone's life. And uh, one of the things that it definitely should change is... Uh, <clears throat> the importance of planning. So clearly nobody wants to talk about their own mortality. Uh, we don't want to talk about our, our own. We won't, don't want to talk about our friend's mortality, our friend's mortality. But as you can see on the slide, the elephant in the room is death. And, and uh, basically it says, ignore me. So we want to get our documents done. We want to know, uh, have someone know where they are in the event we become disabled or die. And we're going to talk about those types of documents today. Next slide, please. So what are our essential documents? Uh, the essentials are a will, of course, uh, commonly uh, known as the document that will distribute your property when you pass away. Uh, the short version is will. Lawyers uh, and judges call it the last will and testament. We want to have a letter of instruction. We want to be able to leave behind documents for our family, for our executor. Uh, that's the individual appointed under a will to manage our estate when we pass away. Uh, a letter of instruction. And that letter of instruction should be updated on an annual, if not more current, basis. As your life circumstances change, your documents will change. The contents of your documents will change. Of course, those life circumstances may be a divorce, and maybe a death. They may be the born, <coughs> excuse me, a new grandchild. Things that are substantial changes in your life circumstance require changes to your documents. Other essential documents, number three, Trust documents, typically we're talking about a revocable living trust. And a revocable living trust is a state-of-the-art method of avoiding probate here in Illinois. Uh, and <clears throat> we should talk about probate very early on because it blends in with the rest of our presentation. In Illinois, we have basically two types of probate. Most people uh, know of only one. 
and that's post-death probate. I think that there's a lot of mythology. Uh, in high school, we studied Greek mythology. This is kind of legal mythology. Post-death probate uh, in Illinois is required if you die with assets in your name alone in excess of $100,000. So that's number one in the world of takeaways, ladies and gentlemen. Assets in your name alone in excess of $100,000 requires that a post-death probate be opened after you're gone to administer your assets and distribute them uh, to your heirs, to your family, to your friends, to the charities. Those are the three categories people typically leave their assets to and allow creditors to have an opportunity to file claims against your creditors. Second type of probate is a lifetime probate, a guardianship case. And if you can avoid that, you want to as well. And of course, a guardianship case is, does Carrie Peck need a third party decision maker to make his decisions regarding the management of his assets or the management of his health care? That's a lifetime probate. Both of those probates, the lifetime and the post-death are heard in the county in which you die a resident of. So in Cook County, they're all heard on the 18th floor of the Daly Center. We have now about 16 probate judges that hear cases every single day, now via Zoom court, a new innovation in the pandemic. And, uh, <clears throat> and so probate is a, a scenario that if you can avoid it, you want to. The fourth document that's an essential is a power of attorney for property, and that's the management of your assets. Fundamentally, the concept is I name perhaps Jennifer Prell uh, uh, <clears throat> of Elderworks to be my agent in the management of my assets. I need to be confident when I make that decision, and my document uh, provides that no, when I'm not able to make decisions, she can make decisions for me in the management of my assets. I saw a question. Peter, did you have a question? Pop up on the chat. He did have a question. He said, does each state have uh, very different probate laws? The answer is yes. Each state has very different probate laws. Uh, but importantly, a revocable living trust is recognized in all 50 states. So it's important that if you're moving to a sun state, for example, Florida, Arizona, you want to consult counsel uh, out there with either your existing documents or have documents done out in the area you're going to live in. Next slide, please. Thanks, Jennifer. So in the world of healthcare, we want to, uh, to the best of our ability, leave behind uh, a personal and family medical history. And we may not want to necessarily focus exclusively on when we're gone because our personal and family history is important during our lifetime should we become uh, disabled, unable to communicate. And people should know, you know, uh, for example, does your family have a history of diabetes? Does your family have a history of Alzheimer's disease? Items that, uh, and illnesses that may be genetic. Uh, in nature. Number six, a durable power of attorney uh, <clears throat> for health care. In Illinois, we have, again, two types of powers of attorney. One is a durable power of attorney for property. Second is a durable power of attorney for health care. The term durable is important because prior to the change in the law, power of attorney expired became when an individual became cognitively impaired. The import of our documents today and the importance of having those documents is should you suffer a stroke, should you get hit by a car, should you be stricken with Alzheimer's disease or any illness or malady that affects your cognitive abilities, these two documents, POA for healthcare, POA for property, will remain in effect and remain valid, viable. So your agent Again, I'm the principal, not of the school. This is 
agency uh, law in the context of our discussion. I named Jennifer to make my decisions. And when I'm not able to make my decisions, she acts on my behalf. Next item is an authorization to release healthcare information. That would be HIPAA. Uh, everybody's heard about HIPAA, H-I-P-P-A. You can't really go to the doctor or interact with a medical office today without being told, well, I don't know if that complies with HIPAA. Well, we can't make, we need to make sure we don't violate HIPAA. HIPAA regulations are very, very strict. Uh, there are monetary penalties for violation thereof. If you give someone uh, your power of attorney for health care, they will have authority to uh, get HIPAA-protected language. If you recall in the recent Jesse Smollett case, uh, and the newspapers reported that uh, Northwestern Hospital fired 50 people for going on their computer and looking at the Jesse Smollett file in an unauthorized fashion. So HIPAA has very significant ramifications. A living will, today living wills are a little bit on the way out. Uh, living wills, you have to have a what's called a qualified condition relative to your end of life decision making. But today people are typically using durable powers of attorney for health care. And uh, more commonly, uh, equally as important, a POLST, Physician Order for Life-Sustaining Treatment, P-O-L-S-T. If you're hospitalized, your physician will ask you and discuss with you your end-of-life treatment. Do you want to be on a respirator? Particularly important in the era we live in now, unfortunately, with COVID-19 which leads into the last uh, number nine on this slide, a do not resuscitate order, a DNR order. Res resuscitation, ladies and gentlemen, in a DNR order is nothing like you see on uh, the healthcare shows that are on TV, the dramas, uh, Chicago Med, uh, Grey's Anatomy. It is nothing like that at all. Unfortunately, in many instances, if it's a fragile older adult, the intent uh, is to get somebody's heart beating again, and they compress the chest, often breaking uh, ribs and doing damage. So it's imperative that with the use of a durable power of attorney or health care, you are given substantial opportunity to choose the end of life decisions while you are competent. Again, in the COVID-19 world, we've heard about respirators. We've heard about a lot of patients being on respirators slash ventilators. Is this something you want or is this something you don't? Discuss your end of life intentions with the person you name as agent. Make sure you have that talk. Very, very important. Next slide, please. So moving on to the asset side of uh, the important documents, you want to make sure that you put your life insurance policies in a safe location. You want to make sure, again, your family, uh, the people that are going to be administering your estate are aware of that. Of course, life insurance is when I buy a policy on my life uh, with a major uh, insurance company, when I die, it pays out provided the premiums have been paid on a regular current basis. Individual retirement accounts or known as IRAs typically are employer employee related. Typically an IRA has a beneficiary payable on death. Okay, significant payable on death. A beneficiary comparable to the 401k uh, account also an employer employee scenario. Typically, uh, the 401k will also have a designated beneficiary payable after I die. That beneficiary has no right to invade those accounts during my lifetime. If you're lucky enough in this uh, day and age to receive a pension, uh, perhaps you work for a government entity that is paying pensions. You want to make sure your pension documents are available to your family 
both during your lifetime and post-death because you may get a pension if you become disabled. Very important. Annuity contracts, likewise, these are important documents that you want your family to have. Typically an annuity uh, in a very, very uh, easy example is I pay often another, an insurance company, I give them a chunk of money, I give them $100,000, and they promise to pay me a monthly income check during the course of my lifetime. Very important if you're going to get involved in an annuity to understand the ins and outs. It's a, it's a very complex topic, and uh, there, there are many uh, ins and outs that we can't we don't have time to discuss today. I see we have some questions. Uh, Lauren, Jennifer? Nope, none at this time. Uh, next slide, please. So in addition to that uh, worksheet that you're going to leave behind, you want to have a list of your bank accounts. Uh, and your bank accounts should be uh, provided on that document with the name of the bank, the account number, and your password. Okay, whether that's a PIN number or whether that's a digital number you're going to use online, Make sure you leave behind, as you can see in the next uh, entry, usernames and passwords. Very, very important. Again, if you become disabled during life, uh, your passwords become critically important to those that are taking care of you and want to make sure that your bills are paid. If you have a safety deposit box, you want to make sure <clears throat> that your uh, updated list includes the location, uh, of the box, the box number, the bank, and importantly, the key. If you don't have a key on a safety deposit boxes, as you can see from our slide, uh, have two keys. The bank has one, you have one. If you lose your key, the bank will be happy to charge you uh, the going rate, which is generally above $300 to bring in somebody to drill open that box. Next slide. Carrie, we have a question. Peter, Peter Kaplan asks, if my spouse passes and has a large IRA payable at time of death, do I pay taxes on that income? The answer is the tax ramifications uh, of receiving an IRA uh, from your spouse are very significant, and I strongly recommend you consult with a certified public accountant. Yes, there are substantial tax ramifications. Next slide, please. So in the context of proof of ownership, we want to, of course, uh, make sure that we have title documents evidencing ownership of our house, even if there's a mortgage. We want to uh, have, uh, if we purchase cemetery deeds, we want to have titles to the cemetery. All of the documents that relate to owning a home, owning land, owning uh, cemetery plots, should be available and again in a folder with your updated information. Mortgage accounts, escrow mortgage accounts. If I'm going to mortgage, <clears throat> if I have a mortgage, the documents should be available to my family. Uh, again, should I become disabled or die? And that information should be readily accessible, particularly if you're married, uh, your husband, wife, your husband, if you die, you become disabled, you have a stroke, you can't communicate your spouse is going to want to know the terms and conditions of the mortgage. Next item, you want to make sure if you have other loans other than mortgages, perhaps you have student loans, how much are those loans, what are the terms, what is the obligation? Vehicle titles likewise should be available, uh, even if there's a loan on the car, you need to have information regarding the ownership, the insurance, and any obligation owed on the car, whether that's to the uh, company you purchased it from, for example, Toyota Finance <clears throat> or General Motors Finance, uh, and the vehicle titles. Should you have uh, a stock portfolio? Today, people generally do not get stock certificates. Stock certificates you probably never see. 
they're with your broker, whether that's at Schwab or Citibank or wherever it is. Uh, savings bonds, you do get a copy. Uh, very important. They should be kept in a safe location. And of course, your brokerage account statements should be available should uh, someone need access to that information. If you're involved in a business, whether it's a partnership or you own a, a corporation or an LLC, all of those documents likewise should be available. Partnership documents, the operating agreement for uh, an LLC, the creation agreements for uh, a corporation, the bylaw documents, the articles of incorporation, in those scenarios, uh, you will likely have an equity ownership interest. That information should be available as well. Many businesses have a, what's called a buy-sell agreement. So if I become disabled, my interest is purchased. Or if I die, my interest is purchased. Those are very important documents that uh, the folks left behind, managing your assets, managing your life, again, whether you become disabled or die, are critically important. And finally, of course, uh, the Illinois tax returns, the federal uh, tax returns, you wanna have your state and federal tax returns in a location where someone can uh, find them easily. That will have an impact, obviously, on what taxes you pay in the future. And if IRS or the Illinois Department of Revenue contacts your family and says, oh, you didn't pay taxes for a certain period of time. You want to have evidence that you paid those taxes and that you filed those tax returns. Next slide. So I think that it's it goes without saying, but I have dedicated an entire slide to this for a very clear reason. Your marital status is exceedingly important. It's exceedingly important in the context of your tax uh, ramifications. It's exceedingly important in terms of heirship, H-E-I-R-S-H-I-P. Do you inherit from someone else? Is there a divorce? We recently got involved in a, in a case in which the only uh, person named as an executor is a former spouse of the decedent. Under the law, a former spouse is disqualified for acting uh, as executor under the will. So it's important that you have the documents, your marriage license, and your divorce papers. Critically important. Keep them in a safe location, ladies and gentlemen. Carrie, we have um, viewers when we discussed numbers 16 and 17, oops, um, um, they, they're just looking for more information on, on numbers 16 and 17. Okay, uh, number 16, uh, as you know, today when you go online, virtually everything you do will ask you your username and they will ask you your password. So. That's critically important both for obviously your email uh, and any banking that you do online and any brokerage uh, information or access to your brokerage account that you do online. You can't do anything online today without a username and a password. And I think it's uh, important that you make a list of those uh, passwords and usernames, but clearly you don't want that to fall in the wrong hands. You wanna make sure that that's protected and given to exclusively your loved ones, people you trust, and perhaps your agent under power of attorney for property that's going to take over when you're not able to manage your own affairs. Number 17, uh, as the slide uh, indicates or the photograph on the slide, you know, a lot of people today do not have safety deposit boxes. Uh, it seems probably away. Safety deposit box is generally in the uh, depths of a bank, uh, well below ground, so it's a, a presumably not easily accessible. You put your important documents in there, uh, lock it up, and the bank uh, guards it 24-7. Let me make very clear, you do not want to put your power of attorney documents 
in a safety deposit box. If you have a power of attorney for health care, you become uh, injured, disabled, stroke again, Alzheimer's, things of that nature, your power of attorney for health care and ultimately your power of attorney for property, critically important. And it will be everybody's good luck that a bank will be closed, anchors hours, it'll be a weekend and you need documents you can't get into the box for. It. So particularly power of attorney documents should not be in a safety deposit box. The power of attorney for health care should be sent to your primary care physician, your internist. They should have your power of attorney for health care and know what your intentions are regarding your end of life treatment and know who your agent is in the event you can't communicate with your health care provider. We have more questions, Carrie, but let's get to those at the end. Otherwise, you'll never get through your presentation. <laughs> you know. How are we doing on time? All right. So, uh, you know, the real question here is uh, who needs estate planning? And the answer is everybody needs estate planning. And estate planning may not necessarily be the same thing for you as it is for the person sitting next to you remotely or virtually. So 55% of Americans don't have a will in place. And most people go, so what? But the reality is if you don't have a will in place and you haven't done estate planning, the state you reside in, or plus for purposes obviously of our discussion today, believe everybody resides in Illinois, Illinois and the General Assembly have already created an estate plan for you. So what does that mean? That means, Carrie, if I'm married and I have no children, it's very easy. All of my assets upon my demise that are in my name alone go to my wife. But what if I have children and I have no will and I'm married? Well, the circumstances change quite dramatically. When I die, all of my assets without a will that are not in joint tenancy or payable on death beneficiaries, again, assets in my name alone, the hypothetical is I'm married and I have three children, okay? Upon my death with no will, my assets are split 50% to my wife and 50% to my children. That 50% to my children goes to them regardless of age or regardless of need. So if they're minors, the circumstance even gets far more complex because the law would then require us to open minor guardianship estates for each of those three children who get 50% divided by three and thereafter, my surviving spouse, my wife, is obligated to go to court to get the use of the money that I left my children. A little hard to believe okay? and easily avoidable. A lot of people say to me, well, Carrie, you know, the kids are going to give the money back to mom. Well, I have to tell you, I've been in this business a long time, and I've never seen the kids in that scenario, it would be adult children give the money back to mom. It doesn't happen. It causes aggravation, expense, trauma for the family, and drama that you want to avoid. Next slide. So what is estate planning? Estate planning, of course, is the distribution of the estate assets upon death, uh, sometimes with asset protection. It's advanced planning for the management of financial affairs in the event of mental capacity along the lines of our power of attorney for property, perhaps the use of a revocable living trust. Likewise, it's advanced planning for health care, could be a power of attorney for health care. We want to avoid probate. Uh, we've talked about it earlier on. That would be the post-death probate. And if possible, we want to do estate tax planning and asset protection planning. Don't lose sight of the fact that both your state government and federal government collect taxes upon the death of an individual. Depending on where you reside, it's state-oriented. 
in Illinois to die with assets in excess of $4 million. That uh, tax will be assessed over the $4 million. And currently, at the federal level, it's a very high $11 million. I suspect that both of those numbers are going to be coming down in the world of COVID, in the world of, of tight budgets, in the world of no tax revenue, while all of us uh, stay home and don't go out and spend money on items to buy for sales tax, gas tax, and things of that nature. So the government entities are gonna be looking for additional revenue from other sources. Next slide, please. So again, uh, the goals of, of uh, planning, even before an estate tax, uh, we wanted to try and protect our assets from creditors. We wanted to preserve if we had the kind of wealth what we call generational wealth. We wanna provide for the support and an income to our family. Uh, we wanna manage the assets for those that cannot manage themselves. And we wanna do business succession planning if we own a business. Next slide, please. So what can I expect if I uh, engage in estate planning? Uh, a small estate plan will focus on how and who will manage your assets if you become unable to manage under what circumstances it makes to distribute your assets during your lifetime. For example, do you wanna make lifetime gifts? How and by whom your personal and healthcare decisions will be made and how and to whom your assets will be distributed after your death. Certainly, uh, if you become uh, disabled during your lifetime and you have um, a uh, minor children, Who's going to be guardian of your children when you're unavailable uh, in a normal uh, circumstance? So we often see young couples that come in after the birth of their first child. They want to make sure they name a guardian for their child. And again, we see couples that come in uh, after they have another child or regrettably get divorced. Uh, then uh, the documents, of course, need to be changed. Next slide, please. A large estate, uh, probably the most substantial change would be tax planning. We want to reduce taxes or postpone the uh, application of the estate taxes. Very complex issue. Next slide. So what is probate? Uh, and I intentionally talked about it early, and now I'm going to talk about it again because there continues to just be a lot of uh, misunderstanding about this uh, terminology. Post-death probate is a court-supervised transfer of assets. Again, assets held in my name alone. So the assets that are not probatable are joint tenancy assets. If I own uh, joint tenancy assets with Jennifer and Jennifer uh, is my wife and I die, she gets my assets. But it doesn't change a bit if Jennifer's not my wife. If A and B own assets in joint tenancy, A dies, B gets the assets outside of probate. Now, many people use joint tenancy to own assets. Many married couples particularly use uh, joint tenancies to own assets. I think we need to take uh, it one step further. If I own assets uh, in joint tenancy with my wife and I die, and my wife survives and takes the assets via joint tenancy, those assets move directly across without probate to my wife. My wife decides that she now wants one of the children to be added as a joint tenant to assist in the management of her assets. How about help her pay the bills? And typically we see this on a very regular basis. The surviving spouse mother uh, chooses a child, more often than not a daughter, to help her pay the bills. She puts her on as a joint tenant. And that works for the purpose of post-death passage of assets. But during lifetime, it could raise substantial problems. If mom puts a child on as a joint tenant, Mom generally gives no consideration because she doesn't know to the notion that 
if that child gets involved in an auto accident and doesn't have adequate insurance, the assets of mom in joint tenancy with that child will be subject to recovery by the injured parties in a auto accident. In addition, now again, mom holds the assets in joint tenancy with a child. If that child gets divorced, those assets are likely to be drawn into the divorce relative to a split up potentially of assets that belong to mom. So joint tenancy, very common. Joint tenancy used very, very easily. Joint tenancy used in massive numbers of particular, particularly marriages. Choose your joint tenants carefully. Don't forget, a joint tenant has 100% invasion rights of the assets in that joint tenancy. So typically we sometimes then see mom is now received the assets via joint tenancy from dad. She adds a child, that child has financial trouble or perhaps has drug trouble, gambling problems and invades those assets to get uh, money out of the joint tenancy and is 100% entitled to do that. So let's go back to our post-death probate slide. Post-death probate, typically a probate. Again, the estate is opened. It's an artificial entity. It's We're opening uh, an estate with papers and we're having the estate of Perry Peck open and we appoint an executor. There's a will, we appoint an executor. If there's no will, we appoint an administrator. Their role and functions are virtually the same. Illinois law requires that a post-death probate estate be open not less than six months. Why? Because creditors are entitled to file claims. Those creditors could be funeral parlors, uh, hospitals, doctors, or they could be your Visa, uh, MasterCard, and uh, American Express cards. So typically they're open and the state is open more than six months and typical delay up there uh, is likely to be the case. Typical costs, attorney's fees, executor fees, court fees, the clerk of the circuit court will collect the fee to open the estate. Uh, and of course, it's a public process that may be subject to a will contest. Will contests are filed when someone is, uh, uh, excuse me, someone is angry, they were cut out of the estate plan. Uh, will contests are filed typically for two reasons. One is Carrie didn't have the mental capacity to do an estate plan or a will. And second, Carrie was unduly influenced by the recipient of his assets. So perhaps he favored uh, one child over the other two in the will and the one, two children that are cut out file a will contest. Next slide. Here's an example of uh, probate. Thank you, Rossum. Here's an example of probate, the king of rock and roll. Elvis is gone now about 50 years and 50 years ago when he died his untimely death, he gathered over $10 million in assets. The king of rock and roll did well. Take a look at the rest of that slide. Over $3 million in debt, almost $2 million in administrative expenses, uh, over $3 million in estate taxes. All of these things are avoidable to some degree. Uh, and he left Priscilla $986,000. Almost 73% of his estate was lost in the probate process. So he could have used a trust. He could have done a variety of other things. But take a look at the top figure, the bottom figure. It's shocking. 10 million to less than a million. Next slide. So additional probate assets, uh, or probate avoidance mechanisms, uh, joint tenancy we talked about. I have a passbook. I want to give it. Um, to uh, the person that I name as a beneficiary. We talked about life insurance. Lifetime gifts, you're entitled to give as much as $15,000 to as many people as you wish. 
uh, with no tax, and living trusts we'll talk about in a moment further. Go ahead, please. Yeah, Carrie, we're running out of time. We have uh, just about six, seven minutes left, and we have a few more questions. Oh, I thought we were we were headed till 11 o'clock, no? So we'll try, if we can just cover these slides, and we have about eight more questions. Okay. Uh, all right, we talked about uh, joint tenancies. Let's go to the next slide, please. Thank you, Gail. Let's go to the next slide, please. So last will and testament operative only upon death uh, and is a public document, does not avoid probate. A lot of people think if you have a will, you avoid probate. Again, our takeaway is that 100,000 figure in your name alone. Next slide. Revocable living trust, again, state-of-the-art method of avoiding probate. Why? I name myself trustee of my assets. I change the title of my assets, my bank account, my brokerage account. I put those assets in to the revocable living trust. And in all 50 states, by legal fiction, virtually by magic, that avoids probate. The document is private. It can be administered in my law firm conference room. We don't have to go to the Daily Center or any other courthouse. It can be amended from time to time. It avoids a need for a lifetime probate of guardianship, and it allows for estate tax planning. It is a terrific device uh, in the circumstances we're talking. Avoiding probate, providing for death or disability. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Irre irrevocable trust, very, very unusual. Somebody wants you to sign an irrevocable trust, your antennas go up, okay? They're used sometimes for life insurance ownership and sometimes for Medicaid planning uh, or tax reduction. Very unusual. Make sure you're with a competent, capable lawyer. Next slide. Power of attorney, we've talked about it. Those are the doublement twins, double trouble. Uh, again, we name an agent to make decisions. We talked about it uh, quite a bit early on because it applies throughout our presentation. Your legal clone, name someone you trust. Next slide, please. Power of attorney for property, we've talked about it. Uh, again, very important management of your assets should you become disabled. Don't forget power of attorney documents die when you die. They are lifetime use documents only. Next slide, please. Exception for a power of attorney uh, post-death is the healthcare agent can authorize an autopsy. Beyond that, uh, these documents die at death. We've talked about it again. Your agent's going to make decisions when you can't make them. Next slide, please. For estate planning, next slide. Uh, Michael Creighton left behind a very, very messy estate. He failed to provide for a child that was in, in utero when he died. Died at the age of cancer, uh, excuse me, the age of 66. And his daughter from a prior marriage uh, objected to uh, that child receiving assets. His uh, will included a provision that said, I make no provision who those that are, uh, you know, not mentioned. And so that was a big, ugly estate mess. Next slide. Brooke Astor, of course, Brooke died at the ripe old age of 105. Her son was convicted of stealing tens of millions of dollars. Witnesses in that high profile case, Barbara Walters, Henry Kissinger, and F.D. Lorenta, they all testified Marshall went to jail at the age of, of roughly 85, 86, for financially exploiting his mother. Next slide, please. Casey Kasem, multiple marriages. They are ripe for dispute, uh, and that was a problem in his case. Next slide. Uh, the Sopranos. So uh, Gandolfini died at the ripe old age of 51, ladies and gentlemen. Estimated a state of 70 million. And he lost about $30 million to uh, federal and state tax collectors. With planning, it could have been avoided. Nothing. Next slide. Robin Williams, of course, long history of mental illness. 
uh, committed suicide. He was married three times, had three children, and there was a public dispute challenging his plan as to who kept the belongings in the home and he acquired during his marriage. Uh, an ugly, ugly case avoidable. Next slide. Ernie Banks, Mr. Cobb. Uh, Ernie, unfortunately, was abused uh, three months before his death. New documents done for him. I was asked to get involved in this case and consulted. Uh, I declined. And of course, poor Ernie uh, died with a significant condition of his death being denoted as dementia. Next slide, please. Sumner Redstone, who died yesterday at the age of about 97 or 98. And that photograph, he's in the center. The women uh, adjacent to him were all his lovers. Uh, and uh, the lady at the bottom sued him for $100 million. She was promised $100 million. He gave her 30 I misspoke. She sued him for $70 million. Sumner owns companies like CBS TV and uh, again, a scenario. This was a, a, a I would suggest, a financial exploitation case, uh, highly, highly publicized. As I said, when the New York Times interviewed me, people are now uh, being, meet their exploiters in safe places, senior centers, churches, and synagogues. Uh, we're seeing it on a too much of a regular basis. Next slide, please. Sam Huff, uh, a famous ball player, I was interviewed by the Washington Post. Sam uh, was picked up by his daughter one day who visited him once a week. She never brought him back and insisted that he do a new estate plan favoring her instead of his longtime, uh, lifetime female partner. Next slide. We've got tons of questions. Let's hear it. Okay, so one question earlier on, Carrie, was um, what does the term HDRT mean? Lauren, let's go back to the first slide. Gail, I'm sorry, H-D-R-T? Yes, that was the question. Sorry, I don't know that I, I used that term. Okay, uh, well, here's the next one. If you're named as an executor, can you take care of, okay, I just lost uh, that question. Let me just go back here. Can you take care of distributing assets according to the will or trust on your own, or do you have to work with an attorney? Uh, you definitely have to work with an attorney. Um, how many years do you keep your tax returns? Seven years. Uh, regarding a letter of instruction, is this something a person can do on their own or is a lawyer required? No, they can do it on their own. This is something, though, if you're going to do estate planning, you should share with your lawyer. Okay. Uh, we are, you're answering them pretty quick. That's great. Um, don't you need a document that gives a person the right to use... Um, uh, your ID and passwords, maybe a paragraph in the durable power of attorney? Uh, I, I think that that would be safer. Yes. I think that, uh, you know, certainly husbands and wives share their, their PIN numbers, their passwords, their usernames. Um, I, I think that if you want to put it in your durable power of attorney, it's a great idea. Okay. Um, Santa yeah, asked... You, you know, in the world we live in today, we're concerned about internet fraud. Okay. okay. Um, what if an only child and other parent passed away? Do I need a more complex plan or more documents than a will? I'm sorry, again, please. Uh, what if an only child and other parent passed away? Do I need a complex plan or more documents than a will? Well, I think we're missing some facts there. Oh, okay. our, our questionnaire, our questioner maybe is... She, yeah, maybe Sanjay, if you can type it in again and we can see if Carrie can answer tell, that. Tell us what your status is in conjunction with the people that passed. And... Oh, go ahead. Okay. Uh, what if there is a large dollar amount CD uh, with a brother named as beneficiary? Does the daughter of the deceased have any rights to any of the money from the CD? Uh, in general, the answer is no, unless that CD perhaps was held uh, as a convenience account. When assets are owned in joint tenancy, and it's not clear to, from the question whether that CD was owned with a parent and a child, but often joint tenancy accounts are held as a convenience account. 
to help mom write a, a checks. Uh, if it's not a convenience account, the other side will argue it's a gift and it was gift made during lifetime. So joint tenancy accounts are subject to attack relative to convenience, uh, defense's gift. Okay, Colette um, mentions on slide 25, marriage divorce. I am currently married 41 years, divorced two years prior. Do I need to have the, that divorce information? I think you should have the divorce uh, information available, yes. Okay. Um, if you're named in a trust, is the executor of the will required to inform you? Well, if you're named in a trust, we're, we're, we're mixing apples and oranges. And this is a good question because you need to understand that a revocable living trust is accompanied by a will. So the executor is named under a will. That's this document. A trust, the person running that trust is called the trustee. Is the trustee obligated to notify you? Certainly, if they're going to do a legitimate uh, uh, administration of that trust, the answer is yes. Uh, if you're concerned that the trustee intends to take the assets for themselves, that's a whole different ballgame. I think it's implicit in that, in that question, but uh, I, I'm not sure exactly of the, the details. But yes, you should be notified if you're uh, named as a beneficiary under a trust by the trustee. The executor and the trustee may be the same person, or they may be different, or uh, a trustee could be a bank, and an executor could be a bank. Okay. I think that's it for the questions uh, that we have. Uh, Lauren, if you can please put in the contact information for Peck Ritchie in the chat box. Uh, we thank you so much, Carrie, for your great presentation, and as always, we have a large audience asking a great questions. And thank you so much for also being a sponsor for today's uh, Senior Fair. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Gail. Thank you, Jennifer. I appreciate uh, always the opportunity to work with you. And folks, be safe out there. Stay healthy. Have a wonderful day.